Hi, welcome to this latest podcast. This is Sharon here with Vivian French, the author. Uh, Vivian has written over 300 books for young people, from babies to teenagers, on subjects as diverse as frogs and chocolate. Indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> chocolate frogs, yes. Frogs. Oh. Chocolate frogs or frogs in chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> I'd quite fancy either, actually. <laughs> uh, wizards and monsters? Yes. Princes and worms? Yes. So quite an eclectic mix then? Oh, indeed. Yes. <laughs> uh, she is an inspiring speaker with exceptional knowledge of the world of children's books and considerable insight into the way in which children use their own stories to connect with those that read and hear. So one of the first things um, our readers might quite like to know about is where do you get your ideas from, oh, especially people, chocolate frogs? Especially <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, I was very, very lucky in that my dad read me a story every single night before I went to bed until I was about 13. I mean, Ooh, I could okay. read, but I just loved being read to. Uh-huh. And he read oh, such a wide collection of stories. Some of them, I think, were probably not really very suitable, but he just loved reading. Uh-huh. And I think if you you read a lot or are read to um, you kind of it's a, it's a bit like being a caterpillar you know you eat all these various things all these different words all these different ideas mm-hmm. and and help that helps right you know with ideas for stories and also I'm incredibly nosy and I listen <laughs> to people oh yes I'm terrible <laughs> I'm always asking questions and I'll chat to anybody mm-hmm. and I'll sit on a bus and my ears will be flapping and uh, I was on a bus not so long ago and there were these two I was on the top deck and these two women came up the stairs and one said to the other well I said to her that if it hadn't been for the banana it wouldn't have happened okay yes. and I'm still thinking Mm. <laughs> what was the banana doing? Exactly. <laughs> and then your mind kind of goes off on all kind of different ideas. Yes, yeah. I mean, I know um, even my own children, you know, um, I read to them after they could also read yeah. uh, because they just enjoyed that whole kind of um, connection with someone else reading it. And sometimes I think as well, children, you know, they, they get tired. They do. And so it's tiring for them to read and they perhaps can't really yes. enjoy the story, but if somebody's actually reading it to them, uh, they just they enjoy that connection and they can relax and listen mm. to the story. I think it's wonderful. I now put stories on, to, and you know uh, Audible, where you get the story with talking books. Yes. And I put stories onto those. And I had a slightly backhanded compliment from my daughter because Charlie is five and he was listening to Alfie Onion uh, Uh with me reading it and she said mum it's wonderful he's asleep before chapter two (laughs) yes that is really backhanded yes in one way it's great yep and the other way the other way is okay was he not really that invested in the book (laughs) but I think that's just it I mean you know there's so many audiobooks uh, nowadays Mm. and I think you know children's lives are so busy um, that you know an audiobook at bedtime or in the yes. car can be just as good as, as somebody reading it themselves yes. or having somebody read it to them. Uh, I mean, I still enjoyed the whole element of reading yes. to the children. And I think as well for me, um, you know, as you say, you get used to a certain level of books that you read. I mean, in my time, it was sort of been at Blyton and mm-hmm. uh, the Chalet Girls. and But, you know, it changed then onto Harry Potter. And um, But I think, you know, it's just getting that right book, getting that connection yes. with the kids. Yes. I think that's what my makes lovely difference. agent always says. There's no such thing as a non-reader. What you've got is a reader who hasn't found the right book. Absolutely, and I yes. think that's so true. I think it is as well, and that's certainly what I found with my two. Was that once you found something that they could engage with, yeah. they wanted to read the next one yes. and then the next one. So you're quite right. Mm. Um, so one of the other questions here is. Um, what is your writing process like? So do you just listen to people on buses and then go, oh, I know I'm going to write a book about that? Um, or do you have a kind of set process when you're writing? Not really, not as much as I should. Um, I do always make some kind of rough plan. And I make my rough plan is usually I think of a beginning and then I think of the ending mm-hmm. and then I work out the middle. And it can be very, very rough and mm-hmm. it often alters terribly. But I need to know where I'm going because otherwise it's like travelling to Inverurie from Edinburgh on a bicycle. Um, you get lost if you don't know where you're going. Yeah, yeah you could perhaps go in a different direction and, then, and 
then there's no end to it. No, indeed, I'd probably end up in Wales, but yes. <laughs> yeah, you'd still be writing it. Yes. <laughs> Two years time, good. Yes. I just lost my way a wee bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, so do you use um, computer? I do. do. You do? I always write on an iPad. Okay. Uh, because one of my problems when I was at school, I went to five different schools. Wow. And um, I didn't actually find writing that easy. Uh, my handwriting was distinctly doubtful, and my spelling... <laughs> My spelling, I think, the nicest way to put it is erratic. Okay. Um, but an I, but once I started working with a computer, that was magic. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the teacher standing behind me saying, "You don't expect me to read that ridiculously <laughs> badly written piece of work, Vivian." <laughs> so um, yeah, it just gives you a little bit of a, a kind of space between you and the story. Yeah, just using that. So is that an iPad you use? Yes. Yeah, because it's quite surprising, really. Um, mm. Because it, so, do you use it with a keyboard? Or do you just, no, no, I just, just use. use it on keyboard the on the iPad. I, yeah. I'm a one finger typer. Okay. Sometimes I use two fingers if I'm feeling very excited about something, <laughs> but usually it's just one and I can actually go really, really fast. Okay. I was going to say, how long is your longest book? Ooh, uh, probably about 80,000 words, something like that. Oh my, but with two fingers. Two fingers. Yep, yep, yes, <laughs> my poor finger. Yeah, yes. your fast fingers, <laughs> could be yes. called. Because okay. um, that was one of the questions that we've got, is that how long does it take you to actually write a book? Oh, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> um, it varies very, very much. I wrote a book a long time ago called The Story of Numbers, mm -hmm. which was a non-fiction book, and I had to do a lot of research, and maths is most definitely not my strong point. Um, <laughs> And that took probably, I would think, coming up for three years one way or another, quite a long, long time. time. Mm -hmm. um, usually, I mean, a novel, a sort of junior novel, um, would be about maybe maybe six months. There's a lot of rewriting because mm -hmm. I never get things right first. I have to do so much, particularly the beginnings. I go back and rewrite the beginning, so it's uh -huh. really punchy. And so do you rewrite the beginning without editorial assistance? No, it's usually with my lovely editor. I mean, okay. I, but she, my, I've got a wonderful editor called Becky, and she says, she always says, Vivian, just stop editing. <laughs> it's, it's my turn now, because I will go back and I will tweak, and I'll, I'll go back again and I'll tweak some more, mm -hmm. and then I'll send her five pages of notes of things that I need to write again, mm -hmm. and she'll say, well, actually, that's my job. Okay, yeah, so you just wait for her to come back to you and then you yes. do the rewrite on it and then yeah. and then does it go back to her again? Oh yes, uh -huh. and again. And again. <laughs> and very often again and again. Okay. And then when the pictures come in, because nearly all the books I do are illustrated, uh -huh. um, and then we'll look at them with the, from the point of view of the illustration and what I can cut out, because the illustration says it. Uh, and okay. also moving things around to fit around the illustration. Uh -huh. Sometimes I'll rewrite things for that. Okay, that's interesting, yeah. is it? You don't really think, you don't think about it, you know, in terms of somebody putting an illustration uh -huh. and then that's sort of changing your story. Um, because often, you know, we, have, we put pictures and things and then we actually tell people what the picture's about. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, you're sort of saying you would take that bit out. If you had an illustration yeah. that demonstrated what mm -hmm. you actually wanted to get across. Exactly. You would then Wonderful change Judith Kerr, I heard talking and she said, why would you tell a story twice? And it, the yeah. illustrations will tell the story, and I teach illustrators, okay. so I'm really, really concerned about that. Yeah. Do you illustrate your own books? No. No. You know, I have this really odd thing in that I teach illustration, and I work with illustrators at the uh, Edinburgh College of Art, but I don't actually illustrate myself. I draw, but I don't you ever don't do illustrate. my illustrators. No. Would you do it for somebody else? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't have time. I think there are so many illustrators who are so much better than I am. And, uh -huh. and I am in awe of them, and I let them get on with it. <laughs> That's probably a good plan. And then I criticise. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right, too. <laughs> Quite right, too. Of all the books you've written, which one is your favourite? That's always a tricky one. <laughs> um, I'm actually very fond of the Steam Whistle Theatre Company because... Uh -huh. I was an actor for quite a long time, okay. so a lot of the things that happen in it, um, like arriving and finding that actually you're not being allowed into your digs, um, actually happened, and um, and I, I love that whole theatrical world, and I worked for a theatre company which did an absolutely dreadful version of Midsummer Night's Dream, mm -hmm. and in the Steam Whistle Theatre Company they do a dreadful version of King Lear <laughs> with songs. Okay, okay. <laughs> that sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Do you have a favourite author? Do I have a favourite? Either children's or um, adult. Well, I would say probably my favourite adult author, without a doubt, is Dickens, Charles Dickens. Right. I'm huge. I read him from when I was about, well, really quite young, I think. And my dad read him to me as well. And I just love the words. I love the terminology. I just, he makes me laugh like a drain. Okay. So I love Charles Dickens. I'm also, I absolutely adore Terry Pratchett. Uh -huh. He makes me laugh uh -huh. as well. I do like funny books. Are you okay? Uh, children's authors, there are so many fantastic uh, children's authors. Hilary Mackay, I always will read anything mm -hmm. that she writes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I love a lot of the older authors as well. I mean, I was brought up with John Maysfield mm -hmm. and Box of Delights uh -huh. and, uh, and, of course, Beatrix Potter. I mean, I can remember as a very small child, my father reading, and the sparrows implored him to exert himself. And I didn't really know what it meant, but I just loved the sound of the words. <laughs> yeah, and Roger Kipling as well. Um, you know, the great grey, green, greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees. How do you remember these things? Um, I think I've just got a good memory. I'm lucky. <laughs> and poetry, and I always, always, I mean, with the grandchildren when they were little, and I used to push them around in the pram, um, I always used to recite poetry to them. The pobble who has no toes had once as many as we. When they said, one day you may lose them all, he replied, fish fiddle dee dee. <laughs> yeah, I was never much into poetry, I have to say. Oh, oh, I <laughs> it love sounds it. good. I love, actually, I love when people read poetry. Yeah. Um, you know, if I have to read it myself, I just always think it's it's just a bit flat. Um, but we have a, a colleague at um, library headquarters who is absolutely skilled at writing poems, and he always writes poems for people who are retiring. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're now we're now calling him the library bard because he's writing poems for um, our website. And you know, I, when I read them now, I hear his voice, yes. and I just do think because it's just like you reading it there. Yeah. And it is just I think it's the intonation that people put into yes. poetry that makes the poem. Yes. And I sometimes think that's we're reading it. I, I just sort of think, oh yeah, no, I don't really mm -hmm. like that. And I think mm -hmm. unless you can imagine the person actually saying it, I do find it quite tricky. Yeah, uh, yes. But I suppose it's just what other people are into. But it, it does make me smile that you say Charles Dickens was funny. Oh yes. Um, you know, because I wouldn't, I, I'm, I'm not really into that, that sort of book at all. And I, I do think, I wouldn't think Charles Dickens and funny. Right. In the same sentence. Oh, read our mutual friend, Mr. Boffin. Okay. Noddy Boffin. He is the most extraordinary character ever. Uh -huh. And very, very funny. And there's this sort of observational thing about certain kinds of characters that Dickens has. Um, there's Silas Wegg in uh, Our Mutual Friend, who has been paid to read to Noddy Boffin, because Noddy Boffin wants to educate himself. And Silas Wegg is a real trickster, and he's a, a sly, sly man. And, um, and his mis misreadings of, of various very famous books are hilarious. Okay, oh, well, there is a recommendation mm -hmm. for everybody to read this funny Charles Dickens books. Absolutely. And they can then get back to us and tell us if yes. they enjoyed the Charles yes. Dickens books. <laughs> Um, a, a final question really is, what do you think makes a good picture book? Do you think it's di all down to the illustrations or do you think it's more down to the story? You know, what makes one of these, what makes these books carry on over time? I, oh, I love picture books. I've got more picture books than any other kind of book at home, partly because I teach illustration. And I think a really beautiful picture book, a wonderful picture book, is a combination of words and illustration and design. Mm -hmm. And there's a, one, there's a quote, which I shall probably get wrong, which is something like, um, where the words and pictures dance and neither leads and neither follows. So that there's this balance between the two. Um, I still think Where the Wild Things Are is one mm -hmm. of the most incredible books ever. Yes. And it is, you need a, a strong story, but you can also have silent books where there are no words and the stories are very, very strong. Mm -hmm. And I love those as well. So if you were reading one of the silent books, you know, what sort of intonations would you put onto it then? I would discuss it with the child and I'd say, you tell me what's happening here. Mm -hmm. And children see so much because they're so much more visual than adults, because as adults we tend to lean more on the words, whereas children, right from when they're tiny, they're seeing things and they're examining them and they're studying them and they're asking questions. And so when they look at the pictures in a silent book, they will see things that very often an adult will miss and they'll interpret it 
in their own way, mm -hmm. and uh, it and it's always so fascinating. There's a wonderful, wonderful book by Marla Frazee mm -hmm. called The Farmer and the Clown, and I've worked with children from tiny, tiny children right up to young adults, and everybody has their own sort of feeling about the story, but. Basically, it's about a little clown who falls off a train, the farmer finds him, looks after him, and then he gets back on the train, which sounds so simple, but it when does. you actually see the images, the emotions there, mm -hmm. and children talk about being lost, about being found, oh. about relationships with grandparents, uh, okay. about, being in it, about being isolated, it's an incredible book. Oh, well, wow. thank you for that. So there's a few more re recommendations there uh, for everybody. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you to Vivian for taking the time out to talk to me today. It was a pleasure. And I hope you all enjoy listening to the podcast. Mm -hmm.